everyone and welcome to Coffee with Innovate Finance, a podcast series where we speak to industry leaders on financial innovation and fintech. Our podcasts are available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts. I'm Hayley Bromelow, COO of Innovate Finance, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Nick Harding, co-founder and CEO at Floro. Floro is a technology-led consumer lender, offering unsecured personal loans via their full suite of products. But who better to tell you more about it than Nick himself? So Nick, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me, Hayley. Very nice to meet you. So just to kick off, I guess, um, for the listeners at home, can you tell us a little bit more about your background? What was your journey to co-founder and CEO? Yeah, sure. Um, So it's really a blend of of technology and financial services. Um, So uh, my education was all focused on computer science and data and and, and maths, really statistical sort of focus, Um, but then went into a career in banking. Um, And actually, um, my career in banking, which was uh, with what's now called NatWest um, between about 2005 and 2010, really taught me a lot of how not to do it (laughs) rather than how, how to do it. Um, and, and, you know, going through the, um, you know, the global financial crisis there. So, you know, really was a, 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 a very interesting period of time and, and, and one where, where we learned a lot. But actually then what came after that? You know, that first wave of fintechs in around about 2010, 2011, that period of time was was actually the sort of precursor to, to Fluoro. Uh, and Matt and I, Matt, Matt's um, a co-founder at Fluoro, um, uh, uh, really felt that uh, it was you know, destiny um, for us to, to go on and build a, a fintech business, given the backgrounds that we had. Amazing. And you touched upon it just then. So it, it was at Lending Works. It's now been rebranded um, to Floro. Um, obviously, can you tell us a little bit about what Floro's vision, mission is, and maybe the purpose behind that rebrand? Yeah, absolutely. Well, wh- why don't I cover sort of, you know, wh- where Floro came from first? Um you know, the the original idea behind Fluoro um, was was one that takes us back. Actually, you know, we we we've just celebrated our tenth birthday as a company. So, oh, on the congratulations! 21st, thank you. Um, <laughs> on the twenty first of November, uh, twenty twelve, um, we we were uh, sat thinking about you know how we're going to solve problems in financial services. And um, actually, when you sort of think back to that period of time. Um, the world was still reeling from the the financial crisis. Um, consumer financial services were, you know, the the, the customer experience was excruciating. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, loan documentation still needed wet ink signatures, for example. Uh, credit data was was very basic. Um, there was no such thing as instant payout or, or instant remittance. Uh, open banking didn't exist, and I don't think Innovate Finance existed nope. either. Nope. Um, so, yeah, when you think <laughs> um, all of that way. Um, what we really saw at that point in time was was the big banks were just failing their customers and, and the customer experience they were providing just wasn't good enough. So our question was, what are we going to do about that? Mm. Um, and we really looked at, at many markets um, and we saw the biggest opportunity in, in or the, the biggest uh, appropriate opportunity for us was, was in the personal loans market. Um, we, we could see that many markets had major sort of structural challenges, but we couldn't see that the solutions were were as possible as they are or were in in, in personal loans. And so that's why we ultimately uh, you know, set out to 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 build up you know, a, a leading personal loans uh, business. Um, the big driver for us, though, as I've already mentioned a couple of times, was always to come back to the customer and say, actually, how can we make this better for the customer? And I know that that sounds cliched, really. But actually, you know, we genuinely mean it. And whether it's our product engineers or our uh, uh, software engineers or the data scientists or anyone working in the business, they're just constantly thinking about how can we serve our customers better. Um, and really, that led us to sort of game changing um, our customer experience. Amazing. And that's a, a great purpose as well, isn't it? Putting consumers at, at the heart of your business and what you do. So, yeah, fantastic. And 10 years, amazing as well. I bet you that's flown by. Um, so what were, I guess, the, the challenges that you initially faced as an organisation when you first started out? Um, and how would you say they differ to the challenges that you face now? Yeah, and and well, I mean, the the challenges on 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 day one were were um, many. Really, you know, we we were a small team trying to solve problems, um, and you know, everywhere we looked, there were there were more problems. Uh, ultimately, um, 
the, the the thing that we kept on coming back to was that we were very good at building technology uh, and delivering uh, projects and and and, and um, you know a customer experience. We're really good at looking at data and, and and how data could be used to to enhance the customer experience. But we didn't have any customers, and we didn't really have any budgets, um, you know, in, in the material sort of sense. So, and then we looked around and we could see, you know, the, the the big banks had all of the customers and they had massive budgets, but they were were terrible at building technology. So that was the the main sort of initial challenge that we 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 had to overcome. Um, and really, that led us um, to you know what the business is today, which is is is, is an embedded lending business. Um, we we could see that there were many uh, um, you know large corporates that had those same problems as as, as the big banks, um, but but ultimately they still wanted to be able to offer products to their customers, and we felt that we could enable them to offer products to their customers oh. uh, via this embedded lending uh, approach. And, and and actually, when you look at it. Um, you know, embedded lending as a term didn't exist then. Uh, we were just trying to, to to build a business, and we were trying to acquire customers and and and, and attract customers to to, to uh, you know to come and get a loan from Fluoro. We 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 really saw it through that sort of problem solving lens. Mm-hmm. And when you look at the outcome, it was kind of a win 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 really, um, because those big corporates were were able to you know create a new product and and, and therefore revenue stream. Importantly, their customers, you know, got got the best in class product uh, when they were doing it, and of course, it meant that we could, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, attract a much bigger market. Yeah. So you touch upon it um, there around the embedded piece, um, and obviously, embedded finance big theme right now. So, so what is Floro's move towards this? Then, what are I guess the plans um, going into next year and beyond? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I touched on on the fact that yeah, we we felt we could sort of solve problems for large corporates, um, a, a, and offer products to their customers. Uh, an example of that is our partnership with with Direct Line Group um, uh, and uh, also Churchill, um, their one of their other brands. And you know that that that, that business has seventeen million active customers, um, and they have you know a very interesting proposition for their customers from an insurance angle. But to go and start lending to those customers would would potentially cost them you know hundreds of millions of pounds to be able to build the business required to to, to do that. Whereas their partnership with us has enabled to do that that much more quickly and much more easily. Yeah. Um, and also gets them straight to a point where where you know they have a best in class product. And with a lending product, it really relies on a lot of data over many years to be able to deliver the product because you know naturally uh, models need to be calibrated over a long period of time. Um, uh, whether that's sort of you know pr- pricing engines, uh, credit engines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so their ability to scale via using uh, our embedded lending platform uh, you know meant that it was much quicker for them to get to market. And also they got to 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 a best in class product immediately. Yes, yeah, definitely. And we see a lot of that with the different partnerships and things happening in the fintech space. So it's so, so valuable. Um, so I guess if we look at that, how does uh, your tech stack differ to others out there in the market then? Yeah, I, I think you, you could probably put it into two categories. You've got the incumbent providers and and, um, uh, and the sort of um, challenger providers. Um, and incumbent providers, I've said it many times, you know, it's, it's easy for, for, for fintechs to take sort of pot shots at, at, at banks, but actually what they have to deal with is very, very difficult. The, the problems they have to solve are very, very difficult because they obviously have massive legacy IT estates and, and tech estates, which are just very, very good, difficult to join together. When I was working at, um, at NatWest, um, they spent a, a great deal of time trying to build a, a, a tech platform that meant you wouldn't have to log into six different platforms every day and you'd have to log into one. Uh, and when they launched it, it just meant that, you know, and, and indeed it carried on, that you just had to log into seven every every day instead. <laughs> uh, the, the, the way that uh, large organizations try to solve these problems is just, it's, it's just very, very difficult. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, ultimately, um, you know, our tech stack being built, you know, from scratch and constantly invested in is one that's using, you know, the, the latest technologies. Uh, you know, we, we have a, a Kotlin architecture that's you know running in, in, in AWS um, uh, infrastructure. Uh, it's extremely fast, but it's not only fast in terms of, of, of you know, customer experience, but also it's, it's you know, our engineers are able to work on it in a very agile and, and, and rapid fashion as well. So an example of this is we built a, a new machine learning uh, pricing um, uh, engine or machine learning capable pricing engine over the summer. And it's something that we could you know put together in, in, in a couple of months, whereas actually some of the incumbent providers take a couple of months just to make one pricing yeah. chain, uh, let alone sort of build a whole new engine and, and launch it into the market. So um, you know, we, we think that the, the way that our, our 
technology estate is set up basically as a competitive advantage and, and that's why we continue to invest in it. Yeah. And that's the beauty of uh, working in a adaptable, fast paced industry as well when it comes to yeah the, the fintech space. So, yeah. how I mean, out of interest, how big is your team now? We have about 85 um, people yeah. in the team. Um, but actually, it's an interesting one because um, many, many fintechs, I think, for, for a long period of time, almost saw it as a badge of honor as how many, you know, as, as in what, what's the, uh, the size of the team and how large it is. We almost saw it as the opposite of that. And it really takes us back to our roots in some ways, which is I really sort of measure success on on you know, how much we can achieve with how few people we have in the team. Yeah. Um, and so actually, we've always been hell bent on trying to um, restrict the amount of, 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 of individual people we bring into the business instead focus on automating instead. Mm-hmm. And, so, um, you know, uh, we're, we're a business that's, you know, always been revenue generating from day one. Um, and we focus heavily on, on on making sure that we we have that sort of solid and scalable platform to, to, to leverage from in terms of being a revenue generating business. Um, and, and in turn, that sort of led us to saying, well, actually, rather than throwing people at problems, we'll, we'll, we'll throw technology at problems and, and make them scalable instead. And so then in turn, that leads to, to, to having a team of, of a very... Um, a technical team of, of mathematicians and data scientists and engineers rather than sort of a, a sprawling team of, of hundreds of people sort of doing op- uh, you know, operational sort of roles. Um, and that's a big focus for us as a business. Um, so, yeah, I say I say 85 with pride that we haven't allowed that to be <laughs> for hundreds and hundreds. You could be a lot bigger, but you've been smart about it by the sounds of it. So <laughs> well done. That's the plan, at least. <laughs> so I guess, you know, we have to talk about the the cost of living crisis and, and what's going on in the current economic climate. Um, has Fluoro seen a substantial increase in the number of people seeking personal loans during this current climate? Um, well, it's an interesting question, actually. Um so, so the whole market it has reduced and it's reduced quite quickly in the last sort of two months. Um, when you look at the whole of market view, we've seen about a one third reduction in the size of the market in the last two months. Um, and, and that's obviously totally in line with the interest rate environment that we've seen, you know, uh, um, you know, come about so so quickly over this well, late summer and, and autumn. Um However, what we see within that market is actually a very interesting cross section because actually the challenger brands who are you know acquiring customers via partnerships and and and, and have amazing customer experience as as Fluoro does um, have been able to to sustain their market share better, whereas the incumbent providers have dropped off further. Um, and so you know ultimately you know we we have a thesis that that um, uh, customers are going to their bank and then all of a sudden rather than seeing the the cheap money that went on for so long um, that they're seeing a much higher APR which is making them look around and so therefore you know are more likely to come to to Floro uh, in doing so. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and I guess, yeah, see obviously how it translates to 2023 activity as well. Um, so I guess looking ahead, as we say, going into 2023 and looking over the past 10 years, um, as you said, when you were founded, what would you say to date are your biggest success stories um, that you'd like to share? Yeah, yeah. Um... It's funny because sort of yeah, you know, whilst you're at the at the coal face, you sort of um, I, I, we don't necessarily celebrate the success stories enough. <laughs> yeah, so, you have to so reflect, important. don't you? Yeah, have absolutely. time to reflect. <laughs> <laughs> what's next? What's next? What's next? <laughs> and, um, yeah, no, you are you are, you are right. We absolutely need to to reflect from sometimes. Um, I, I think one of the things that I'm most proud of, uh, which you know you, you'll have probably got loud and clear already, is our customer experience. Mm. Um, but actually, you know, when you look at uh, not not just the level of customer experience, your know, net promoter scores are off the charts, you know, et cetera, et cetera, which we're really, really proud of. But actually, the the, the breadth of customers that we we are now, uh, you know, uh, um, basically able to to um, to reach. So we we reach about ten percent of all working age adults every year. Um, so we see about four hundred thousand unique uh, uh, requests onto our APIs every month. And when you annualize that, you know, 4.8 million, there's about 45 million working age adults in the UK. So we're seeing about 10% of all working age adults in the UK, which is is really staggering uh, when you think about it. Um, and so it's not just, as I say, the, the, the quality of the, the product and the experience we, we, we're generating, but also the breadth of, of the, the um, uh, you know, uh, the range of customers that we, we can attract. Also, you know, our, our uh, embedded lending proposition is one that we are really, really proud of. You know, we think that 
um, you know, for example, with with direct line, the proposition that we we have available for them is one that is unrivaled um, in the market, and so therefore, um, you know. There, there were some incumbent providers providing this sort of arrangement in the past, and ultimately they just didn't work very well. Um, and so therefore we think there'll be a, a significant um, move from, from anyone who's already doing, or you know, a, 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 a brand that's using an embedded lending provider is probably going to be looking for new uh, providers or vice versa. There'll be lots of new brands coming to, to say, you know, we, they want to open up that revenue stream. Wow, some impressive stats there. So uh, yeah, very very successful. Um, so congratulations on that. Um, so I guess as we wrap up and uh, wrap up this conversation and, and look ahead, what's next for Floro? Have you got any big announcements or things that you would like to share on the horizon? Yeah, um, it, it's a really interesting time, isn't it? Because we're on one hand, like everyone, just very cautious about being, you know, prudent and and, and risk averse, considering the, the backdrop that we have. But the other side, other side, we're, we're very excited about, you know, what the future holds and and and, and building a business. I, I think, you know, we take all every decision we make, we think about a long term approach. You know, we're 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 an organisation that's private equity backed as opposed to VC backed, and so therefore we're very much looking for building value over the long term. And so there, there isn't, uh, you know, an immediate sort of focus on, you know, we're, we're racing to do this project or that project, but instead it's building the entire infrastructure and architecture of the business simultaneously, whilst also growing the customer base rapidly. Um, and all of that is coming together really nicely. So we think, you know, in a, in a weird sense that 2023 could be a year that we, we scale the business, you know, fairly significantly. Um, and certainly, you know, when, when you know, we, we feel that the sort of, uh negative economic environment starts to subside will be a period of time that we we certainly will will um yeah, be looking to to grow uh so really that is our big focus for 2023 there'll, there'll be partnerships there'll be announcements <laughs> i'm sure etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, but it's you know, when you look at it as a sort of bigger picture it's to navigate you know these 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 uh difficult economic times and and, and to support our customers in, in in going through that and then coming out of the other side to be ready to to really you know put on the afterburners yeah got a busy year ahead by the sounds of it um but yeah i wish you all the best nick it's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you today um that really enjoyed our discussion so thank you to our listeners we hope you've enjoyed this episode too please keep an eye out for upcoming episodes on our podcast channels all our previous episodes are available on our website so please take a look at our catalog for many more insights on fintech and financial innovation Thanks once again, Nick, today um, for joining us and thank you for our listeners. Bye for now.